Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's great that we can be here together as we come to celebrate and worship this morning. We can see our Advent candles. We're in the third week in Advent, and it's going to be a time of remembering our Lord Jesus Christ and his birth at this time. Will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Almighty Father, we thank you for this time we can be together. We thank you, Lord, that as we come together in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, that we are so aware at this Christmas time that Christ is all and in all. So we ask this morning, Lord, as we meet together, that once again you might be very present with each one of us, that as we sing your praises, as we hear from your word, as we meditate and pray, that it might be a time of quietness, a time of reverence, but a time of joy, because we're entering and we are in the presence of Almighty God. So be with each one this morning, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, The Virgin Mary will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place, what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin, will give, will, the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Just our COVID notices again. Uh, please keep your masks on during the service. We have hand sanitized and remember to keep our distancing as we seated together. And then on Christmas Day, and we've got to say DV, which means God willing, as Bob would say WP, weather permitting. <laughs> and now we've got to add on to that COVID allowing. <laughs> we will have our service. Remember, our, our Christmas service traditionally is moved half an hour earlier so people can get off to family and friends for their Christmas dinners. So we'll be meeting at 9 o'clock on Christmas morning, CA, COVID allowing. We're going to stand as we sing together. Once in Royal David City stood a lowly cattle shed. Let's stand as we sing.
you. Please be seated. I'm going to ask Greg and Dolores as they come up and lead us with a candle lighting ceremony. The third Sunday of Advent, the promise of victory over death. Last Sunday, we lit two candles in our Advent wreath, the candle of peace and the candle of forgiveness. We light them again this morning as we remember that the same Jesus who was born in Bethlehem will come again to fulfill God's promise of peace. He forgives our sins. The third candle of Advent is the candle of victory over death. The people of this world grieve and suffer because of death, injury and disease. In his love, God promised to wipe the tears from every eye and destroy death forever. The Old Testament reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 25, reading from verse 6 through to verse 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast for rich food for all, of rich food for all, people, peoples, the banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We light this third candle to remember that in Jesus Christ, the power of life was stronger than the power of death. The Gospel of John begins by telling us, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in, in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the confidence you give us in your victory over death. We ask that as we wait for all your promises to come true, and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word and to do your will by trusting you in every circumstance. We ask this in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem and triumphed over the grave. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing together.
Thank you. Will you please be seated? We're going to come to a time of prayer. Before us, we have the table laid. Uh, it's going to obviously be a communion again with a difference. But as we do so, the word says we prepare our hearts as we come to the Lord's table. So will you bow with me as we do so? Lord, we've sung about once in Royal Davis City stood a lowly cattle shed. The example of our Lord Jesus Christ as he came to Bethlehem, born of a virgin, but yet in his perfect life set us an example of how we are to live in Christ. Lord, your word tells us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And the second command is like it, to love our neighbours as ourselves. Oh Lord, we haven't loved as we ought. We haven't loved you with everything that we are, our very beings. And we haven't loved our neighbours as ourselves. Oh Lord, we come before you this morning. As we seek our own hearts. Those times we've acted in our own interests, those times we've put ourselves before you, ourselves before others. Oh Lord, forgive us. When we have willfully and knowingly gone astray, oh Lord, point out our errors that we might turn from them and follow you. Lord, when we have hurt others, Sometimes unknowingly. Show us when we've done so. Give us the courage to go and make right with those people. And in turn, Lord, come before you in repentance, in submission. Asking you through your Holy Spirit to give us the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge that we might not fall into temptation again, but as your word says, we, you might deliver us from the evil that our hearts sometimes desire, which we know is wrong. So Lord, as we come to your table this morning, we don't come trusting in our righteousness, but we come before you humbly, asking for your mercy, your forgiveness, O oh Lord, as we come to remember Jesus Christ and his death, we ask that once again it might impress on us the sacrifice, the commitment, the obedience that he had. And he calls us to follow him in our lives of sacrifice, commitment and obedience. So we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn now in our Bibles to John, John chapter 5 and verse 24 onwards. John chapter 5. This is the words of Jesus. It says this, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to life, to live. And those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but to him who sent me. Just so far in God's word. We're going to stand as we sing together. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground. Let's stand as we sing.
John chapter 5 and verse 1. The whole idea of today, this day in the Advent uh, candle and the Advent weeks is what? Life. Resurrection. From the first candle that showed us the promises. The second candle, forgiveness. The third candle is life. That we have been promised life in Jesus Christ coming to this earth. That all, he said, the shroud of death will be removed. To the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we will have life in its fullness. When we are ushered into heaven and there will be no more death, no more dying, no more illness, no more sorrow, no more pain. So we're looking this morning at there are two resurrections. There are two resurrections. Now I'm not talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about you and I. You and me? You and I? You and me. Thank you. You and this person standing here. George Bernard Shaw said this, The statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of every one person will die. Isn't that true? We have a 100% mortality rate in this, on this earth. No one is going to get out of this life alive. And that is true for every single one of us. But it's a reality. It's a sobering, sobering reality, isn't it? That sooner or later we've got to face death. Now the younger you are, the more distance it seems. And the older you get, the more you realize that you're moving into the waiting room. I'll remember as a teenager doing the most incredibly stupid things. When I was hiking, when I was jumping off rocks into, into mountain pools, you name it. And... Uh, the scarier the better and when I think about what I used to do in those days today I think I don't know how I survived my teen years and as we look at life we've got to realize that we've got to be prepared we've got to be prepared Jesus yeah in the section he's been queried by the religious leaders because he claimed that he is God and look at verse 24 he says this, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. If you hear my words, they are of power to bring life. When they queried him, because Jesus claimed in verse 17 and 18 that in very nature he was God. In verse 17 and 19, he says, just look at what I've done. I've done the things that God can do. Therefore, I'm God. In verse 20, he says, he has the knowledge of God. As God does, so does he. Verse 21, that Jesus has the same power of God. And all of this puts their nose up. And the religious leaders now are trying to, to say to him, but how can you be? You're just a man. And Jesus now goes along and he trench, entrenches in their thinking that I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. No one else can claim that claim. No one else can say my words will lead to eternal life. And Jesus here is saying you need to come to hear what I have to say. In the old translations, that truly I say to you is put in which way? Verily, verily, I say unto you. Remember? It says that again. Or truthfully, truthfully in some of the translations, it says that. So the first thing I want to see this morning is that there are two groups of people. There are only two groups of people. In this whole earth, there are only two groups of people. Look with me there. Clearly, when it comes to being alive or being dead, there's only two groups of people. There's not the zombies and the half-deads and the wannabe deads and the wannabe alives. Again, look at verse 24. It says, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me has eternal life 
and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. He has crossed over from death to life. Jesus here says there's only two people, those who are dead and those who are alive. And he's not talking about breathing and surviving as human beings. He's talking about spiritually. You're either spiritually dead or you're spiritually alive. The promise that we had in Isaiah was exactly that. That when the Son of Man comes, he will rip away that shroud of death and give life everlasting. And that is what is promised in the Old Testament. It was realized in Jesus Christ, but is ignored by many people to their own detriment. Jesus' word stands here as his entire teaching from beginning to end. Hear my words, believe the one who sent me, and you will have eternal life. He spoke in chapter 8 and verse 38. He says, everything I hear from the Father, I declare to you. He says in chapter 5 and verse 37 to 38, he says, the Father testifies about his Son. So all Jesus' teaching right throughout will say, this is life and life eternal. In Matthew chapter, uh, John chapter 1 and verse 1. Go with me to John chapter 1. This is true John, not Matthew John, but true John chapter 1 and verse 1. Look at verse 4 with me. In him was life, and that light, life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Jesus came as the light of the world, but with it brings life to all mankind. There are only two people, those who are dead in Christ or dead in their sins, and those who are alive in Christ. John chapter 10 verse 25 says this, Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. It says there, my sheep hear my voice. Now today, they herd sheep in a completely different way than they used to in Bible times, don't they? I was watching a video clip and I thought, let me see a good shepherd that calls his sheep and they follow him. And they've got motorbikes and 4 by 4s and sheep dogs and even chasing them around in, in, um, in buckies right throughout herding them in the fields. In the time of the Bible, in the Bible times, it used to be exactly the opposite. The shepherd used to go ahead of his sheep, call them, and they would follow him. The other shepherds, if they were not calling their sheep, their sheep would not follow that shepherd. They would only follow their own shepherd. So if one of the shepherds decided he was going to take his sheep to other pastures to go and feed them there, he could walk away with his sheep. His sheep would follow him, and the rest would stay behind. And Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. I call my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. And I give them eternal life. And we can say with absolute thankfulness and praise that we have heard the call, the voice of Jesus Christ. We hear his voice. We want to follow him. And he will give us eternal life. Because those who are left behind do not belong to the one who is called. Those who are left behind, we can say, are, are spiritually dead because they haven't heard the call of Jesus Christ on their lives. See, sheep will follow. Sheep will follow their master. If it's not Jesus Christ, they're following another master. 
What master are you following? What voice have you heard? Have you heard the voice of the good shepherd? Come and follow me. I will make you fishers of men. I will give you peace. Do not be anxious. I will be with you always to the end of the age. Or do you follow the one that says later? It doesn't matter. This is just religious stuff. It's a crutch for some people. Many people are saying that today. I am amazed. In this time of coronavirus, of uncertainty, of death rates, that people are not falling over themselves to say, where's life? If this is the life that we expected, we, we're locked down and we, we can't go anywhere and, and all of our liberties have been taken away, then what is life all about? But you know what they're doing? They're turning to everything else. Every other idea, every other philosophy, instead of coming to the one who gives life and life to the full, who gives life, eternal life, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. John Morris said this, it is more common to have reference to believing in rather than just believing and having Christian, having Christ as the object of your belief. See, do we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or do we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? See, we can prove from history, from records, from all these stories that Jesus Christ actually existed. It's there in history. We can go back and we can find it. But that's believing about Jesus Christ. But you believe in that you put your trust in him, your belief in him, your faith in him. Because if you hear his voice and you believe in him, you will have eternal life. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 to 4 says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. On Thursday morning, it was Beth who said, that's one of her favorite verses. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus came, he called his sheep, and those who are in him are no longer condemned, but they have life and life to the full. What the law couldn't do to make people righteous before God, Jesus Christ did through his death on the cross. And through the centuries, he's been calling people's names. He's been calling, come to me, all you are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you shalom, rest. I will give you peace. Verse 24 points us back. My words, hear them. Not only let them be part of what enters your ears, but take them into your thinking, into your mind, into your heart. And you will have eternal life. Because God himself has promised it. Secondly, only one person gives eternal life. Second point is only one person gives eternal life. And we worked, looked at that. Look at verse 25. I tell you the truth. A time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of God. Voice, sorry, the voice of the Son of God and those who hear him will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has granted the Son to have life in himself. When is the time coming Jesus is talking about? When is this time that he's talking about? Well, in John chapter 4, verse 23, he says this, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers 
the Father seeks. Jesus is talking about himself. The time is coming and is here because I am proclaiming life to you. He's not talking here about future. He's talking here about now. He's talking about it 2,000 years ago when he spoke. And his voice has been going out through the millennia. To you, to I, to all those who've heard his voice. And have either responded or rejected that call on their lives. Again on Thursday we were chatting and talking about the whole idea of predestination. Who, who, who is predestined and, and how do we deal with those who are not? We don't know who is predestined. We don't know who God has chosen. We don't know who's, who's, who's listed in the book. All we know is we've got to go out and tell people, share the voice of the good shepherd with them. And it is up to them and up to God and through his spirit to draw them to himself. I said this before. I have never saved anybody in my life. Not one person has been saved because of me. I present the gospel and I call people to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because salvation is his job, not my job. I can't save anybody. I'm just a man. The true savior of the world, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, the one who gives life, is the one who saves. And all I can do is preach the gospel, call people to repentance, and point them to the Savior of the world. And that is what we are called to do. Remember Lazarus? Lazarus? In John chapter 11, verse 43, Jesus cries out to him, Lazarus, come forth! And that's exactly what he did. He came from the grave. The words of Jesus Christ that gave life. And in that way was tangible life. He has promised to give us eternal life in him. Right throughout the scripture, we saw the one in Isaiah, where life is promised again and again. When you read through the, the servant songs in Isaiah, from Isaiah 55 through to the end of Isaiah, there's a whole lot of servant songs there. That's a, the servant songs are all about Jesus Christ and what he has come to do, the Messiah and his purpose on this earth. And again and again you'll see, as you read through those uh, six servant songs, that there is promise of life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Messiah, the Son of Man who is coming. And he has promised us, there's only one person who gives eternal life. And that is Jesus Christ himself. I read this to you a little bit earlier on. I won't go back there again. John chapter 1 verse 1 to 4. But in him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shining in darkness. Because Jesus Christ is the life that has been given to each one of us. Thirdly, this morning, only one who has the final say. There's only one person who has the final say. Who do you think that is? Is that you? Is that me? There's only one person who has the final say, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Look with me at verse 27. John chapter 5 and verse 27. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to, will rise to life, to live, sorry, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. In this world, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you plan. It doesn't matter how you've got your idea of what religion is about. 
It doesn't matter whether you think that you can sort it out in the end. It doesn't matter how good you can negotiate. There is one judge and he has the final say. And he's not going to judge according to how you think he should. He's going to judge according to his rules. Remember what I said last week? Did I say it about, but you can't run into a soccer field with a rugby ball and decide that you're going to play rugby instead of soccer? Well, that's what happened in the beginning of Web Ellis, but we're not going to go there. Um, but you play according to the rules. You can argue with the ref as much as you like, but he will say those are not the rules. And we think we can do exactly the same with God. We can negotiate with him. We can discuss with him. We can maybe work out our plan in the end. But there's only one who judges. And his say is final. <laughs> and no correspondence will be entered into. <laughs> Sorry, I just... That's where my mind went. And that's exactly true. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit from those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, resurrection from the death also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive again. If Adam brought death into this world, meaning that each one of us will face death one day, that's just the human judgment on each one of us. So Jesus Christ, who although he died, he rose again. And he's not dead now. He's seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, living, reigning, waiting one day to return. He is the only one that can give us life. But we don't do it in our way. If he has died, if he has risen from the dead, if he has ascended into heaven, and if he's coming back as the judge, it's his way or no way. It's his way or judgment. It's his way to salvation. Or you stay dead in your sins and your transgressions. A father has given us all authority or given him all authority to judge. In Daniel chapter 7 Verse 13 to 14, it says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man. Coming down from the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. Who is the Ancient of Days? God Himself. And He says, All authority is being given to Jesus Christ. He has the final say do it His way or face the consequences. And I thank God. I thank God. That he has opened that door wide for each one of us as he called our name. Come, hear my voice. Follow me. That is what we need to do. And then there's the warning in verse 28. It says, every single person from the beginning of time till when he comes again will be asked the question. What did you do with the words of Jesus Christ? What did you do when you were called? Did you turn to him or did you turn away? Every single person, those who are righteous, will be taken to glory. Those who are not will face judgment. It's very simple. See, when we come to Christmas time, that cuddly little baby in a manger is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Son of Man who came to this earth 
as a baby to open the door for us through his sacrifice on the cross. But he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. See, we cannot face Christmas and the baby in the manger unless we face his purpose. And it would be remiss of, of me at this Christmas time to say, are you ready? Do you have life in him or not? There's only two eternal destinies. Those who are raised to life and those who are raised, raised to punishment. Condemnation, it says in the scriptures. Throughout John, we see again and again what that means. It means, be ready. It means, are you prepared for Jesus Christ's return? It means, the call has gone out. How have you responded? Have you responded with an Amen? Or have you responded with a not now, maybe later, next year, next month, when I'm old enough, when I've seen life enough, Where are you? Can you say, Lord, I just thank you, as my head is bowed this morning, that you called my name. I heard. I responded. Yes, Lord, that is our prayer as our heads are bowed. We want to respond to you. And thank you for those of us who've heard your voice. That we have life in your name. Lord, we praise you that Christmas time for us is a joy. We remember Jesus Christ, that baby in the manger. But more than that, we remember that he died for us on the cross of Calvary. And as we have the table laid before us, a reminder of his body that was broken, his blood that was shed. And we thank you this morning that as we hear your word, that we have life. There are two resurrections. When we are resurrected from our death in sin. And then one day when we are resurrected again. To be with you in glory. Oh what a glorious time that will be. Oh what a glorious celebration that will be. Oh Lord. We praise you and thank you. Lord as we come to. Put our hearts before you. Maybe there's someone here this morning that has heard your call and avoided. Who has not turned to you. Oh Lord, today, so move in their hearts and their minds. So open their ears that they might hear and turn to you in repentance and faith. We ask and we pray this. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing angels we have heard on high and then we'll commit ourselves to the Lord's table. Let's stand as we sing together.
as we come to the table this morning, again, as we have done in the past, um, it's the little containers we have. Each one has got a bit of bread in it. There's also grape juice. Um, we'll rise from our seats. We'll move in a clockwise direction. So you'll come from here, you'll collect, and then go back to your seats. Um, and I'm just going to ask you to maintain a one and a half meter distance uh, between you as you do so. It doesn't matter how odd or how different communion is from what we expect or how it's been done in the past. It doesn't matter whether it's in containers and the tables being cleaned with um, sanitizer and there's no tablecloth. It's all about the remembrance of Jesus Christ. As we've been speaking this morning about He has given us life right here in front of us is a remembrance, is a, a show for each one of us. It's called a sacrament. I mean, just a sign that Jesus Christ died for us, that we might have life. That we might have eternal life in His name. And the Apostle Paul said exactly that. He says, For what I received from the Lord, I also pass unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, He took bread, and when He had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So each one of us need to examine ourselves before we partake of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, eats and drinks judgment on themselves. Will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Lord, we thank you again that you are our King, our Lord, our Master. That you are the Good Shepherd. That your words have power of life in them. Because eternal life has been promised to each one of us. Who hear your voice and turn to you. And believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we come this morning to partake of the cup and of the bread. Let each one of us again be filled with joy in the knowledge of the salvation we have, the life we have in Jesus Christ. That we have been resurrected from death to life. And one day we'll face the resurrection when we'll meet you in heaven. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. But for this morning, Lord, as we eat, as we drink, so strengthen our hearts, strengthen our faith, that our eyes might continually be fixed on you, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. As you come up from this side, will you come and collect one of the small containers with bread in it and one of the larger containers? And then you can go back to your seats and then we'll eat and drink together. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we come to remember Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. As we take this bread, let us remember that Jesus Christ's body was broken for us. And let us feed on Him in our hearts by faith. With thanks to Him. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. 
And when he had given thanks, he said to them, This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for me, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us drink and be thankful. Almighty Father, we thank you for this time that we have had together this morning. We thank you, Lord, that as we are going to leave this place, we don't leave just going our own way, but we leave knowing that we walk step by step with you, yes. that your indwelling Holy Spirit with each one of us, walks with us, lives with us, encourages us, and we are in fellowship with that Holy Spirit. We are never alone. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. So with the words of Scripture ringing in our ears, with our bodies filled with the thought of Jesus Christ and His death, the great sacrifice on our behalf, part us now with your blessing, that we might go into this week ahead of us and to the time going into Christmas, celebrating our Lord Jesus Christ, not only just a baby in a manger, but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who gives life eternally and one day will come to take us to be with Him forever. Oh, we praise You. Oh, we thank You. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Master, our King and our Saviour. Amen.